My name is Rocky Forrest with a news update from CSAF. Welcome to What Are the Prophets Up To This Week? We're getting reports that the prophet Obadiah is holding meetings with small groups of Judean refugees and exiles who are living in and around Babylon. Refugees are in Babylon because they were captured by the Babylonian army or taken to Babylon to serve the emperor. So they're not happy to be there in Babylon. Obadiah is having small group meetings in which he's trying to encourage the Judeans to have hope, to believe that God will do something. But people are having trouble believing Obadiah. They want to have proof that God is going to do what Obadiah says. But all Obadiah has are words. Now the Babylonians aren't sure what to do either because they don't know what to do with him. It's just words. He's not telling anyone to start a revolution, but his words are challenging the power that Babylon says it has because he's saying the day is coming when Babylon will be defeated and will not have power. Things could get tough for Obadiah. We'll have to wait and see. We'll keep an eye out to see if there are any attempts to stop Obadiah from speaking, any attempts to silence him. Thank you for listening. Tune in next time to What Are the Prophets Doing This Week? Welcome to worship here at St. Andrews. We're so glad that you've decided to join us for this service. and We hope that you will feel God's blessing reaching you, and we look forward to seeing you someday, maybe hopefully in person in the space here. But our call to worship is printed. It'll be on the screen. It's also in what was sent out to you by email. Um, and I invite you to respond with the part that's in bold print that's for you. O oh God, you summon the day to dawn. You teach the morning to waken the earth. For you, the valleys shall sing for joy. The trees of the field shall clap their hands. For you, the kings of the earth shall bow. The poor and the persecuted shall shout for joy. Your love and mercy shall last forever. Fresh as the morning, sure as the sunrise.
Let us pray. God of grace, we rejoice that you have sent your Son to live among us. We thank you for his great love shown to us. We thank you as well for the gift of the Holy Spirit that walks with us, strengthens us, gives us hope and courage. And we rejoice that your kingdom is coming and growing. We welcome its signs and look forward to its expansion. Come to us anew this morning. Pour out your Spirit upon us that with joy and celebration may we, we may look forward to your love being lived in our world. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our prayer of confession is on the screen, also printed. Let's pray this together in unison. O God of Shalom, we have built up walls to protect ourselves from our enemies. But those walls also shut us off from receiving your love. Break down those walls. Help us to see that the way of your heart is through the reconciliation of our own hearts with our enemies. Bless them and us that we may come to grow in love for each other and for you. Through Jesus Christ. Amen. Hear the good news. is while we were still sinners that Christ died for us, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Thanks be to God for the good news that we have been redeemed and saved to begin again as the followers of Jesus Christ who rejoice that the king's kingdom is growing. Amen. I don't know about you, but sometimes it's really hard not to laugh at people. Yeah, sometimes we laugh with people because they say silly things and they know it's silly and we laugh with them and that's good. But sometimes we laugh at people, don't we? And that's kind of cruel, sort of mean. And then sometimes when people say not very nice things about other people that are funny, we laugh with those other people and that's not very nice either. And when that happens to us, when people laugh at us, when people say mean things about us and other people laugh, that's really hard. That doesn't feel very good at all. We're going to be thinking about what it means to be bullied, to be a bully, to live a different way. And so we're invited to be people who follow Jesus. Jesus laughed with people when they told silly jokes. Jesus actually had a good sense of humor, but he never made fun of other people. No, we can laugh with people and that's good, but we shouldn't laugh at people. Let's pray. Lord God, help us to be people who have a good sense of humor, who enjoy laughing. Help us not to laugh at other people, to not make fun of other people. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Just before our scripture readings, let us pray. God of grace, open our ears. Help us hear from you. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first scripture reading comes from the first part of the book of Obadiah. Obadiah has only one chapter, so we only know it by verses. So the first part of Obadiah, reading verse, verses 1 to 4 and then verses 10 to 16. The vision of Obadiah. 
Thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. We have heard a report from the Lord, and a messenger has been sent among the nations. Rise up, let us rise up against it in battle. I will surely make you least among the nations. You shall be utterly despised. Your proud heart has deceived you. You that live in the clefts of the rock, whose dwelling is in the heights. You say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? Though you soar aloft like the eagle, though your nest is set among the stars, from there I will bring you down, says the Lord. And dropping to verse 10. For the slaughter and violence done to your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you, and you shall be cut off forever. On the day that you stood aside, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you too were like one of them. You should not have gloated over your brother on the day of his misfortune. You should not have rejoiced over the people of Judah on the day of their ruin. You should not have boasted on the day of distress. You should not have entered the gate of my people on the day of their calamity. You should not have joined in the gloating over Judah's disaster on the day of his calamity. You should not have looted his goods on the day of his calamity. You should not have stood at the crossings to cut off the fugitives. You should not have handed over his survivors on the day of distress. For the day of the Lord is near all the nations. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your deeds shall return on your own head. For as you have drunk on my holy mountain, all the nations around you shall drink. They shall drink and gulp down and shall be as though they had never been. Here ends our scripture reading for the moment. So today's prophet is Obadiah. And Obadiah is one of the exilic prophets. He lives during the time of the exile. And living during the time of the exile, he's come through that period of time of going into exile in Babylon. Now we need some background here. The base letter or prophecy is against the people of Edom. The people of Edom were the descendants of Esau. The Judeans, from whom Obadiah comes and who worshipped God, the people we usually think of as Israelites, the Judeans were descendants of Jacob. Now, Jacob and Esau were brothers. Not only were they brothers, they were twins. And if you remember the stories of Jacob and Esau, they didn't like each other very much. In fact, Jacob tricked Esau and then tricked his father to walk away with the birthright and the majority of the inheritance. And Esau was left with little. Now the people of, who descended from Esau, the Edomites, ended up in the southeast part, southeast of Judea. And they lived in a mountainous area, a really mountainous area. In fact, the city of Petra, that you may have heard of and seen pictures of, cut into the side of a cliff, that is part of Edom, and they lived in a rocky area. So the passage that says they live in a cleft of the rock high in the mountains is very accurate to where the people of Edom lived. And the letter is against them. This prophecy is against them. Why is it against them? What have they done? What have they done to deserve God's wrath here? Well, when the Babylonians came and captured Jerusalem and Judea, the Edomites didn't try to stop the Babylonians. Not only did they not try to stop the Babylonians, in fact, they helped the Babylonians get what they wanted in capturing the land of Judah and capturing Jerusalem. And we hear that, heard that strongly in verses 10 to 14 of the book of Obadiah, 
when he says you should not have. You should not have gloated when Judea was captured. You should not have ridiculed the people of Israel when they were captured. You should not have looted the cities after the Babylonians had been there. You should not have turned over the fugitives to the Babylonians. Is the people of Edom had not only not stopped the Babylonians, they in fact had been more than just bystanders. They had stepped in and taken advantage of the fact that Judah was being crushed by the Babylonians. They had lined their own pockets with the remnants of what was, and they had prevented the fugitives, those seeking to run away from the Babylonians, from escaping and had turned them over to the Babylonians, and the Babylonians had taken them into exile. No, the people of Edom had not acted well towards their cousins, the Judeans. And God's not happy. We live at a time when there's much conversation about bullies these days, and we're learning that it's not just the bullies who matter, it's also the bystanders. And there's interesting research that says that people who are being bullied, who are being picked on, do remember what the bullies said and did, but far more vividly, they remember those in the crowd who watched and did nothing, those who could have acted but did not try to stop what was going on. And so there is an enormous amount of reflection on what it means to be a bystander in the face of bullies that may take place around us. Now, bullying is not just something that happens on the school ground. It's not just something that teenagers and maybe almost teenagers do to each other. No, there's bullying throughout our lives. We know it well. And to my shame, I have witnessed bullying and I have not stepped in. I have not intervened. Now you can say, well, why would I step in? It's dangerous. I might get beaten up by the bully. But again, here the research is really interesting. Even two or three voices in the crowd saying this is not right, this should stop, actually changes the whole crowd from egging on and supporting the bully to actually saying to the bully, no, don't do this. Two or three voices in the crowd can shift the whole crowd to protect the bullied, to protect those being harmed. And Obadiah invites us to be those people who, stand aside, who do not stand aside from the bully and let them do what they want, but rather to be those who step up, who speak a word of saying, don't do this, who trust there will be another voice or two that will join us in saying, stop this. We are invited not to be bullies, absolutely. We are also invited by the power of the Holy Spirit with the strength that God gives to us to be those when we witness bullying, when we see it, to say, don't do this, stop to be those who stand on the side of the bullet, who do not laugh at, with those who laugh at others, to be those who act for the right, who have the courage to speak. May God give us the strength, the courage to not be bystanders who say nothing, but to be among those who say this must stop. Amen.
it's useful to have a bit of Israelite history in our heads as we think about the prophets. So we think about the prophets as either being before the exile or during or after the exile. And the exile is a significant moment in the life of the people of Israel, the southern two tribes. The ten northern tribes, called Israel usually, had been assimilated by the Assyrians and were gone from the picture. Judah and Benjamin, often called Judah, to put the two of them together because Benjamin was so small, were in the southern part of what we think of as Palestine. The Babylonians came and captured the land and took the leadership, not just the people who were in charge, but even in fact most of the upper class off to Babylon to work there. And among those people would be Daniel who and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This moment of being taken off into exile and then 70 years later, the descendants of those who'd been taken come back to the land of Israel, that 70-year period is a watershed moment in the life of the people of Israel. They believed that they were safe, that they were always going to be protected by God, and God allowed them to go into exile. And so the prophets who spoke before the exile warning the people that something was going to happen had their words fulfilled. And those who live after the exile either look forward to the return to the land, which Obadiah does, or after the return, in fact, to the land, how to live in this new reality, in this new time and this new place. And so the exile is this significant moment as the people of Judah realize that God will sometimes punish but also returns them to the land of it, to the land that they had around Jerusalem, to the land of Judah. And so the exile is this critical moment for the people of Judah. Thanks for tuning in. We continue our reading in Obadiah, starting at verse 17 and going to the end of the book. But on Mount Zion, there shall be those that escape, and it shall be holy. And the house of Jacob shall take possession of those who dispossess them. The house of Jacob shall be a fire, the house of Joseph a flame, the house of Esau a stubble. They shall burn them and consume them, and there shall be no survivor of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. Those of the Negeb shall possess Mount Esau, and those of Shaphala, the land of the Philistines. They shall possess the land of Ephraim and the land of Samaria, and Benjamin shall possess Gilead. The exiles of the Israelites who are in Halah shall possess Phoenicia as far as Zarephath, and the exiles of Jerusalem who are at Sepharad <clears throat> shall possess the towns of the Negev. Those who have been saved shall go up to Mount Zion to rule Mount Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. So we continue in Obadiah. There's a bit of a change here. The change is this. Obadiah has spoken judgment against the people of Edom for what they did, for the fact that they stood aside as bystanders and did not, they, they pro helped support the bully's actions. But now Obadiah has a challenge. Because it's not just enough to tell someone they've done wrong. It's not just enough to ask for vengeance. It's not just enough to see the other side punished. Because there has to be hope. It's not just enough to see the other side get beaten up. You may have heard the story about what happens with retaliation. 
that all you end up is with two people who each have black eyes. No, there has to be a way forward. There has to be something more. There has to be something different. And so he speaks of hope. He speaks of a day coming, a day coming when things will change, when the world will be different, when, as he says at the very end of his book, the kingdom will be the Lord's. The day is coming when God will rule. The day is coming when the bullies will no longer be bullies and reconciliation will have taken place. When the kingdom will be the Lord's. When the reign of God has come. When the mountains sing for joy. That day is coming. That day is coming. But we say, when? When will that day come? Because we look around us, look around us even in the last couple of months, couple of weeks in our own country. And we say, when is that day coming? The deep sorrow that we as a nation feel as it is revealed of more and more children's graves, unmarked children's graves, we feel the sorrow as well as Arabic-speaking people, people from the Middle East, people from Asia, live in fear in our country. We feel the burden. We wonder, when is that day coming? We live in the midst of a time of COVID and fear and anxiety. We live at a time when the words of anger are high. We wonder, when is this day of hope, this day of promise, this day coming? When will things change? When will something new happen? I read a survey that really surprised me. It indicates that of those between the ages of 18 and 34 in our country, 62% of those people between ages 18 and 34 are anxious, feel anxiety about going back to the way things were. Anxiety is high. Anger is high. When will this change? When does it change that these are not just words that Obadiah spoke? These are not just words of the Bible promises of the new kingdom coming, of God's reign arriving. When does it move beyond just words? When will we see something happen? Obadiah never says. You'll notice never is there a timeline. Never does he say when the change will happen. So what do we do? How do we live? I think we're invited to live into the moment, to lean into the promise, to lean into the hope, to believe that the world someday will be God's. Someday that day is coming and we can live now, not just expecting that day, but live now as though that day is here. Live now in that hope. Live now as though the day of God is actually on its way, is actually here, is actually beginning. To live now as though that day is here. To live by that hope, by that promise. Yes, we feel anxiety and fear. I understand that. But we live in the hope that God's kingdom, God's reign is on its way and we can live in hope now of that fact. We live in a world where anger runs high, where it is difficult to find people speaking civilly to one another. But we can be people who live by the Jesus pattern, who choose not to insult the other, to live now by that pattern. 
Jesus invites us to grieve with those who grieve, to mourn with those who mourn, to laugh with those who laugh. And in this moment in our country, yes, we can mourn and grieve, even as we look ahead to the day that is coming when every tear will be wiped from every eye. No, I'm not soft-selling. I'm not saying we should not be serious about the losses. No, we grieve. But we grieve as those who have hope that a new day is coming. We live a new way. And so we are invited by Obadiah to live now as though the kingdom is here now. Yes, I know it's not here yet. But to live now by the practices and patterns, to live the Jesus way now. For the day is coming when the kingdom will be the Lord's. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's pray together. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this family of St. Andrews, and each one of us has a place in it. Although we are physically apart, our spirits join together in praise of you today. We marvel at your love and all the wonders your hands have made. You sent your Son to show us how compassion can touch all of life. You have given us the Holy Spirit to guide us in our daily lives. Thank you for these gifts. Make us mindful of your enduring presence so that we experience you not only in life's mountaintop moments, but also in the simple tasks we do each day. God, you are a God of justice, and there is so much in this world that needs your transforming power. Where there is violence, instill your peace. Where there is poverty, send your sustenance. Move the hearts of the rich to share with those in need and the powerful to act with justice for the most vulnerable. You are a God of compassion. So many places in this world need your healing love. Wherever minds and hearts are troubled, bring your comfort. Wherever pain is unrelenting, grant gr relief. Soothe the pain and ease the loss of those who grieve and bring hope to the hopeless. We pray especially for our indigenous brothers and sisters as they deal with the pain of the treatment they have received over the past years. We all want Canada to be a country where people love and care for each other, no matter their color, ethnicity or faith beliefs. A country where justice and fairness prevail for each and every person. Show us the part that we can play in making our country an example of your love to the rest of the world. We know that there is much that we can do to show your love right here in our own community, and we ask for your guidance in this also. Use us to spread the good news of your love, and we pray that through the work of this congregation, many more may come to a personal relationship with you. Lord, there are those in our St. Andrew's family who are facing trials of many kinds, worries about health, finances, and relationships. Some are grieving the loss of loved ones. Comfort them, Father, and show us where we can be your hands and feet to help. We thank you for the vaccines which are bringing hope to us all. As things open up in the weeks to come and we're able to gather in person, we ask for your protection and guidance. We thank you for Peter and ask that you uphold him in his ministry. Please give him strength and energy through these changing and challenging times. And may he always be very conscious of your Holy Spirit leading and sustaining him. We ask these things through our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
So welcome, um, again welcome. A few announcements. So you're watching this for the service for July 4th, which means that we have opened. And so we are open for worship in person and also obviously also online. Um, and we are moving, we think, probably up to 25% capacity, which will take us um, probably, I'm doing this math in my head on the fly here, so that's why I'm a bit stumbly here, to probably 65 to 70 people that we could have in the building. Um, so if you're interested, call in and we can get a spot for you, I'm sure. You'll see an announcement there also about the search for the new youth pastor. If you're aware of people who might be interested in this job who've, and you want to um, let them know about the position, send the and a link, send me their phone number or their email or whatever, and I can send out the email, the package to them and so they can see it. We also have a special opportunity this summer. The Presbytery of Waterloo Wellington has given us a grant, um, and we're going to use part of that grant to support the Center Wellington Food Bank. And the way it will work is this. So people in the congregation using whatever means they give, by their offering envelope or par or whatever ways they give to the church. If they wish to be part of this project, they can mark a piece of what they're giving, a portion of what they're giving to be for the food bank. And the grant from the presbytery up to $2,500 will be matched dollar for dollar against what people give here at the church through um, to St. Andrews to, for the food bank. So our hope is, if you do the math quickly, that we'll be able to gather between the grant and what people give to give $5,000 by the end of the summer to the food bank to support its work, um, important and valuable work here in Centre Wellington. This being the 4th of July or the service for the 4th of July, you'll know that on Monday, the 5th, our vacation Bible school starts. And so we're still is space. And if you've got, you know, a young people, children, kids who would be interested in part of this, they can come and register and we'd love to see them. And then the following week, starting on the 12th, is our sports camp here. They will need to register online and there's information about how to do that in the announcement stuff. And then in August, there is on-site ball hockey camp and that's taking place here at the church, but they you need to register with on-site. And again, there's information about how to do that in the materials sent out as part of the bulletin order of worship material. Let's thank God for opportunities that we have to give, um, that he might use our givings for his glory. Let's pray. God of grace, we thank you for your blessings in our lives. Take these gifts that we return to you Use them for your honor and for your glory in this, your world. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Go knowing that the kingdom of God is on its way, that God's kingdom will be here. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be as now and forevermore. Amen.